Hello, and this is uh, going to be the second part so, of Unit 1, Planet Ocean, where we're going to talk about early explanation of the ocean, uh, exploration of the ocean, uh, where we actually talked about, uh, we're going to talk about different uh, groups of people who went into the ocean for different reasons, uh, primarily to get from point A to point B. Uh, and as you can see, we're going to start with the Polynesians. Uh, the Pacific Island uh, if you take a look at all the Pacific Islands, and I'm using a mouse now rather than my tablet, so if you hear clicking, that's why. Um, the Polynesians started over here uh, in Indonesia, and over a, a series of three massive movements between 1,800 BC and around 500 BC for two, and then three actually moving from Tahiti uh, to Hawaii, Easter Island, and New Zealand uh, from about 800 to 1,000 AD. Um, they used small, uh, small islands which were widely spaced out. Um, we don't know exactly how they did it, except that they used birds, waves, clouds to come up with maps that look like this. Um, the little seashells you see are islands, and the uh, sticks that they've got or the reeds that they've got are actually wave patterns. So they were actually using all this stuff to uh, come up with uh, maps of the early ocean. Uh, they started off with narrow, uh, shallow uh, canoes and also they had uh, houseboats and they would actually start off from islands like uh, the Solomon Islands they would go out in all directions um, some of them found islands I'm pretty sure some of them didn't uh, they starved they died of thirst uh, whatever and they're both pre uh, finally progressed to canoes with houses on top um, they actually were able to take plants from their one location uh, to another um, the way palm trees actually move from place to place uh, some of their animals moved from place to place. And normally when we think of Polynesians, Hawaiians, Tahitians, um, uh, Indonesians, um, living in very warm climates, uh, very festive people, uh, with lots of different uh, festivals going on. Mediterranean cultures uh, from the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Phoenicians between uh, 1500 and 300 BC actually did exploration of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, they're coming out of basically, um, well, they're coming out of the, of the whole area of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it's not so much just Greece or Italy. Um, it's it's all different places. So they're coming out and they actually look, they explore the whole Mediterranean Sea. They go around Africa and they actually get up into the British Isles. Um, to take a look and uh, what things look like. So the maps of the world are actually getting bigger in Europe as well as just in the Pacific Oceans with the uh, Polynesians. The Greeks, um, again, more exploration of the Mediterranean Sea, but uh, they're going to go out and look at the British Isles, and they're also going to get all the way to Iceland. Uh, Herodotus, which is the Mediterranean Sea, uh, around 450 BC, and Pythias, which is uh, 325 BC, uh, making it all the way to Iceland. So the maps are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, Romans, uh, Strabo, uh, Ashley is talking about how water rises and sinks. He's actually seeing places in the Mediterranean that are actually showing dry land, which are showing evidence of water. And we're actually going into some of the oceans there, like the Mediterranean Sea, and seeing uh, um, remnants of uh, people living. So they're actually, he's talking about the water rising and falling. Uh, could actually be part land rising and falling too. Ptolemy, um, which I use in earth science, uh, he comes up with a whole lot of things, but basically he's coming up with a map. And you're starting to see um, Africa showing up on the map as well as a pretty decent view of uh, Mediterranean and even the Indian Ocean, although you know there's something to be said with uh, our maps today. But And he's also talking about wind, um, primarily uh, the primary winds, which are coming out in different directions, which help people move around. Vikings, um, they're exploring the North Atlantic. Uh, they're basically coming out of the Norway, Finland, Sweden type area. Um, they're going through and they're actually raiding uh, British Isles, they're coming up and raiding France, they're raiding um, Scotland, Iceland. Um, they actually make a home in Iceland. They make homes in southern Greenland, and uh, there's some talk about Leif Erikson actually making it all the way to Finland, uh, which is Newfoundland and Canada. So, And they're doing it well before uh, 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. 
and then their settlements are abandoned by 1450. So they you know they they take back into uh, the Norwegian area of in, of Europe. Chinese exploring the Pacific and Indian Ocean. They're looking for silk uh, places to sell to sell silk, move the silk, and also get spices from uh, India and some other areas. Uh, the thing they really did is they actually had uh, huge ocean-going ships. This was a normal, um, like, Columbus-type ship, and these were the Chinese ships with multiple masts, um, and they were able to travel basically anywhere they wanted to. There's some talk about them making all the way to Antarctica uh, way back when. Uh, they did come up with the compass, um, where they actually had a spoon made of metal, uh, metallic uh, magnet type material magnetite and what it would do is they'd put it on a smooth surface and this thing would swing back and forth um, regardless of where the ship was and point to primarily north age of discovery portugal trade routes portugal had trade routes to africa europeans north and south america columbus and cabot and then magellan and the um, this is the guy who actually manned Magellan's boat after he was actually killed in the Philippines way back when. So you can see Magellan going this direction around South America, really tough to go around this location, going across the Pacific, uh, gets to the Philippines and uh, is murdered, and uh, probably uh, probably wasn't real good to the Philippines, the Polynesians that were living there. Um, and then you can actually see uh, De Cano, um, actually finishes Magellan's trip back around and around. So circumnavigating, uh, the boats did, uh, but under two different captains. Drake also did the same trip, but he did it uh, about 60 years later. Uh, instead of going out of the Pacific, he goes up South America. He goes into North America, uh, makes it up into what's called Drake's Bay, and then goes across um, real close to Hawaii, and then makes the trip around Indian Ocean, uh, pretty much the same way Magellan's boats did. Columbus, Magellan, and Cabot. Cabot did Europe over to Canada. Columbus did, uh, and that was just a couple years later, Columbus actually did it 1492, October 12th, probably landed in the Bahamas, not North America, uh, thinking he was in India. And this, you have to imagine that the world, um, the idea of the world was a lot shorter because he think he, he went all the way across over to this location. Um, they had no concept of how big the earth was. And then this is uh, 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 Magellan's trip again, uh, where he gets to the Philippines and he's killed in 1521. I'm not going to really ask you dates, but I would like you to know relative dates between uh, you know, the Polynesians and then all the way through to where I'm going to stop pretty soon. British islands <clears throat> dominated the naval, dominated the ocean pretty much between 1600 and the early 1900s, or so about 300 years. Spanish Armada, um, that was the actual end of uh, Spanish rule when the British kicked their backside. New technologies are coming in, 13th century magnetic compass, three mass ships for longer distance, and we were coming up with pretty decent maps with latitude and longitude so we can actually figure out our locations by 1569. James Cook uh, actually had three different trips. Uh, he did the Endeavor, he did the Resolution and the Adventure. He mapped many islands in the Pacific, systematically measured ocean characteristics in terms of temperature and currents, and he had the advantage of the marine chronograph. Uh, John Harrison uh, actually came up with this uh, clock which did very 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 well on a boat swinging back and forth up into you know you can imagine grandfather clocks so up into this point um, the pendulum which moves back and forth which is um, works moves the works of the clock um, were changed by the shifting uh, wave motions of the, the ship and what it did is basically made all clocks not work and what you do with a clock is you have the time in Greenwich Mean Time you have the time in your location based on the sun, and from that you can figure out your longitude. Latitude was much easier. You can do it with sun, you can do it with stars, uh, but longitude we needed to come up with a clock because longitude is a man-made object. We could have put the prime meridian anywhere, and that's what we call zero Zulu time. So it's a fairly important start, a fairly important starting point, but it's man-made, so we needed a clock to compensate for it. Cook's voyages. 
Uh, his first voyage you see in red, and does a couple curly cues out here. I don't know why. Maybe saw whales. Uh, goes around New Zealand, uh, goes up above Australia, underneath Africa, um, right next to Madagascar, back up to Europe. The gold is his second voyage, and you can see he comes down this way, and he actually moves around, uh, zigging and zagging, and then comes back out this way, goes the opposite direction, and then comes back in, does all kinds of motion here in the southern Pacific, and then moves over and then back up the coast and finishes. And then the last one is the green line where he, right in this location, he does both his trips, but he goes out this direction. Zimba and zagging goes all the way up to the bear, uh, uh, up through the Aleutians into the uh, Bering Strait, uh, almost makes it up into the Arctic Ocean, and then comes back around uh, Soviet Union, Japan, Philippines, and then comes back around, takes the same trip back up uh, to England. So he's quite a traveler. James Ross and John Ross, Ross actually look at uh, life in the ocean and actually looks at Antarctic and uh, Arctic life as being very similar. Um, and the amount of life in the ocean lessens with increased depth. Edward Forbes, this gentleman right here, actually finds out that there's very little depth in the ocean. Uh, all three of them discover that the life in the deep ocean is pretty much the same everywhere in the ocean. So that the characteristics down there in terms of pressure, temperature, uh, light, food source, and all that seems to be very similar, where on the surface the tropics are totally different than the poles. Uh, deep water all is around four degrees. It's tremendous pressure, no light, so the life forms are, are very similar. Challenger Expedition um, they had four years where they actually went out into the ocean in a ship that was actually made for study. Uh, it was the birth of oceanography. They did water chemistry, find out the materials in the water. They did uh, depth gauges, dropping lines down with weights to figure out how deep the water was. Uh, they did temperature studies, light studies, sediment and sediment studies. They discovered almost 5,000 new species. They discovered the deepest depths in the ocean in the Marianas Trench. Uh, they actually analyzed seawater sea at all latitudes, longitudes, and depths, and they classified deep sea sediments in terms of uh, uh, whether it's terogenous, cosmogenous, hydrogenous, or terogenous. Here's the trip that they did in those four years, and you can see there's uh, barely a stone unturned. I'm not sure why they didn't go up in the Indian Ocean, but went down below here, but all over the Atlantic, lots of places in the Pacific. Nansen um, on the boat Fram, uh, which is actually coming out of, uh, I want to say Norway, um, actually did Antarctic ice current studies where they actually put their boat in ice and they watched the ice move the boat around. It actually was uh, stuck in the ice and the currents, because it's an ocean, not a land mass, the currents push the ice from place to place and they actually moved all the way across and a year later they popped out the other side and went home. Um, Nensen actually comes up with a Nensen bottle, which we'll talk about later with water current. Um, also had uh, Ekman on the boat, and Ekman comes up with what's called the Ekman spiral. We'll talk more about this when we talk about water currents, but there's basically what's called Ekman transport. So if the wind blows one direction in the northern hemisphere, the Ekman transport, the net motion of water is 90 degrees to the right, the southern hemisphere would be 90 degrees to the left. Uh, Coriolis effect. Early American contributions, uh, Ben Franklin, Postmaster General, map of the Gulf Stream, um, actually found out that boats going toward England and boats coming back actually had to take different routes for fastest travel and he wanted to know why and he actually uh, hired captains to do uh, temperature studies and he realized that the warm water coming out of the Gulf Stream um, actually made it all the way across the Atlantic and bathe uh, the English, uh, England, the, um, the islands of uh, basically Western Europe, um, but bathed those islands with warm water. And then if you wanted to come back, you actually went down by Africa and then came across the ocean and back up through the, with the Gulf Stream. Matthew Murray, um, father of oceanography, he comes up with the first textbook for oceanography, so it's something that can be used in universities. And Alexander Agassi, um, 
he worked for the United States Oceanographic Research, and they together came up with uh, lots of studies for uh, basically college folks. And I think that's going to be it for this video, and it is. We'll do the 20th century later. Thank you much for stopping by. Appreciate it. Bye.